John Roskam is the Executive Director of the Institute for Public Affairs. He's also a fortnightly columnist with the Financial Review, and uh, we'll be talking tonight with John. And of course, my colleague Janet Albrechtson uh, writes a, a weekly column in the Australian newspaper. In fact, I hired her more than 10 years ago. I, I joined the Australian in the summer of 2001 and 2002, and the first thing that Michael Stutchbury, then the editor, who's now at the Financial Review, said to me, Switzer, you're more than welcome to hire your choice columnist. And we need to replace Frank Devine, who at that stage had retired from his weekly gig. And so I, uh, I sounded out Janet, and she wrote, I think the first column was on the perils of multiculturalism, and the second column, I might be wrong on the detail here, but the perils of judicial activism, and I think the next column was on the perils of um, uh, the human rights PC crowd. And I'll never forget... Day by day, I started getting concerned journalists at News Limited saying to me, Switzer, um, <clears throat> who's this Janet Albrechtson? <laughs> She's not one of us. <laughs> to which I replied, I'm not sure I'm one of you either. <laughs> so Janet's been wonderful and she's been writing this column for every, every week now for the last 10 days. I thought I'd start the conversation by turning to Janet and just looking at this issue of freedom of speech. Um, it is extraordinary. As an idea, it is hardly a controversial issue, the freedom of expression. I mean, it's not like the carbon tax, for example. Why this persistent need for a debate about free speech? Why are we having this conversation? Yeah, it's a, right. I hope this is working. It's on the wrong side. I've worn the wrong outfit, apparently, <laughs> for a uh, microphone. So if it's not working, please let me know. I have to move my whole body rather than my head. It's, it's not? Do we need to turn it on? There it is. Yep. Is it working? Yep, right. I'm going to hold it. Um, yeah, it's interesting that we keep having this debate. Um, my daughter said to me the other day when she saw something on television, why, why do we have to keep talking about free speech? Isn't it just a, you know, a given? And sadly it's not. And I don't think we can quite pick a date when things turned, but certainly I think between uh, you know, perhaps 30 years ago things started to turn when we started to focus on values um, apart from free speech, values that seem to trump free speech, values that sound great in the abstract, values such as tolerance and diversity and inclusion. Um, and once they trumped free speech, then all sorts of things happened. We lost ground and we've never really gained ground. We've been in, in retreat ever since. And Mark talked about Salman Rushdie and the satanic verses. I think that was a turning point. I think we were tested and we failed. Um, you'll recall at the time that we accommodated um, those who were preaching violence. The fatwa may have been issued in Iran, but I think the damage was wrought back home in Britain where there was accommodation of those preaching violence. Um, then President George H.W. Bush said at the time that both Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, and the fatwa were equally offensive. <laughs> And ever since then, we've taken that attitude. And right. you can, we can reel off the examples. Mark mentioned some of them, the Danish cartoons. Um, we've had Random House pull, uh, pull the publication of a book just in case it causes offence. Um, we've seen South Park censored um, for sending up the fact that Muhammad is the only guy free from ridicule. You know, I mean, what yeah. irony we yeah. have there. Um, so South Park can send up uh, Tom Cruise hiding in a closet and send up... Jesus Christ, it can mock hippies, it can mock the disabled, gays, mm. but it can't mock Muhammad. Mm. Um, and we've been on a decline ever since. And, uh, and again, as Mark mentioned, we, we have new, now have this new norm. It's a norm of anticipatory surrender. And remember, it's always done in, in, in the sense of we're trying to help you, we're trying to make society better, we're trying to be more tolerant. It's always done with fine-sounding language. Um, last month, sorry, this month, um, Saudi Arabia outlawed the celebration of Valentine's Day because they were trying to protect women from those cads who were carrying roses and inviting women out to dinner when, of course, in fact, they were just trying to get them in bed. <laughs> it's always done in, in, you know, with the right intention, apparently, but um, the effect of it is incredibly depressing. So we are, we are left to have these debates, but these debates are incredibly important, incredibly important. Mark, uh, George H.W. Bush indulged in moral equivalence. Yeah, and I, I think there was, a, there was a lot of that. He, in fairness, he wasn't quite the biggest idiot uh, at the time. I, I would, I would uh, accord that honor to a fellow who is uh, long forgotten happily, uh, whose name was uh, 
uh, Roy Hattersley, who was the deputy leader of the British Labour Party at the time, who, and this is interesting in, in the way people calibrate their commitment to free speech. Uh, and he said his reaction to the controversy was that Salman Rushdie had the right uh, to bring the novel out in hardback, mm. but not in paperback. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and certainly when it comes to soft spines, uh, Roy Hattersley knew, uh, knew whereof he spoke. And, 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 we have tried, and we have tried that with everything, that, really everything that has, uh, has come along since. And it doesn't matter. You know, there's a very simple thing here. The, the, the minute some guy threatens to kill you, the conversation's over. I did a drawing. I wrote a play. Uh, I did a t sketch on a TV show. You want to kill me. Those are not equivalent things. When the, when the guy said, we lost uh, the, the day after the Danish cartoons, when all those guys started rioting and killing, uh, the uh, New York Times and the uh, Le Monde and the Times of London, and yes, the Australian, uh, should all have published those cartoons, uh, and they should have said, if you want, if, if you, if you want to if you want to kill us you better have a great credit line at the bank of jihad because you are going to have to kill us all and instead uh, when 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 uh, people went around intimidating that cartoonist's daughter at her little primary school uh, in effect uh, everybody uh, at the times and le monde and everywhere else all said oh well sometimes free speech means having the uh, courage to know when not to speak up. So even in our cowardice, we congratulate ourselves. One, one of the things I found intriguing about that debate over the Danish cartoons, generally speaking, um, I was struck that the countries that were very hawkish in the lead up to the Iraq war, the United States, Britain and Australia, in those countries, I don't think many, if any, newspapers uh, reprinted those uh, cartoons. I think the only paper in Australia was the Courier Mail, and uh, it was revealed that uh, the sub-editor, who had no idea what was going on, just uh, used one of them because he needed to fill it in space. <laughs> <laughs> but, but leaving that aside, Australia, America, and Britain didn't really publish these Danish cartoons. But intriguingly, the, the old Europe, as Donald Rumsfeld put it, France, Germany, a lot of Scandinavia, uh, were very quick to publish these cartoons. How do you account for that diversity, that, that, the different range, Mark? I, th I, think it, I think it's a kind of, uh, I, I, think there's a, I think the uh, Anglophone democracies have a slightly um, different attitude to, to law. There are all kinds of, as most people who've been in Europe know, that in Italy everything's against the law and Italians ignore them, all the laws against it. Uh, in, 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 for the most part in Canada, in Australia, in, uh, in Britain, in the US, there are fewer laws and people uh, tend to follow them and that I think they also largely self-police in certain areas. Uh, and I think that was one of the interesting uh, differences. I mean, they understood what was at stake uh, in, a, in an odd way uh, that the French, that French satirical magazine that got sort of firebombed only a few weeks ago, in a way understands what's at stake in a way some of these more moneyed Hollywood types don't. It's an odd, it's an right. odd distinction. I, I do recall President Sarkozy was quite a big defender of publishing those Danish oh. cartoons at the time, talking about the great French tradition of derision and satire. Mm. But it was barely a few years later when somebody um, produced a voodoo doll in the image of Mr. Sarkozy and he was very quick then to um, pursue it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember a lot of the prominent neoconservatives in the United States who were obviously strong supporters of the war in Iraq, Bill Crystal, John Podhoretz, uh, were very quick to condemn the cartoons and very quick uh, to condemn any publisher for publishing it on the, on the grounds that uh, this is not civil. It's a, we'll talk about this later, but this is not polite behaviour. We should treat each other with more respect. Um, Janet, back to you just before we go to John. Left, right, I know these, uh, these ideological divides, they, they foster simplistic divisions and they create artificial alliance some of the time, but what divides the left and right on this issue, this illiberalism, if you like, of the left versus the paternalism on the right? Um, I think you find plenty of paternalism on the left, too. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm obviously very critical of the left. I don't think either side is perfect when it comes to free, uh, free speech, but I'd rather be on our side than their side um, and, and call myself a true liberal. I think there are basically two rules for those uh, on the left when it comes to free speech, and that is that 
we are either too dumb to be trusted with the consequences of free speech, and therefore you see all these sorts of episodes of political correctness, whether it's sanitising in at Blyton, whether it's analysing you know, homophobic messages in um, The Lion King and so on. Um, it, you know, it's endless mm. it's on, on, a, on a daily basis. So there's that paternalism, but then there's also the second rule of liberalism, uh, and that is that you are too evil um, to, to speak freely, and we see that day in, day out. I mean, Mr Howard um, was a victim of that throughout his prime ministership on issues such as immigration, um, we've seen it with Geoffrey Blaney in Australia, which I think was perhaps the most disgraceful episode, that uh, Geoffrey Blaney was hounded out of mm. Melbourne University for his uh, views on immigration at the time. 1984. Correct, correct. And, uh, and, and most recently, I think we saw it with, the, with those Australia Day protests. It wasn't that Tony Abbott's wrongs were, uh, views were wrong. It was that they were evil and they ought not to be uh, publicised. So there are those two rules. The other big difference, I think, between the left and the right on this is there is a, there's a level of presumptuousness, smugness, if you like, on the left. And, I mean, don't take it from me. I, um, I recall listening to an interview with Lionel Shriver, who's fated by the Sydney Writers' Festival. So I'll put her in the class, you know, category of being a lovey. And uh, <laughs> when she was in Australia, she, she pointed to the fact, or she said that what she found most disturbing about the left was that if you looked halfway decent, you were assumed to be wildly left-wing. Now, you know, I, I, I can vouch for that, and I notice that Morris Newman is here in the audience, but I'll say this anyway, but when <laughs> I was at the ABC and I would turn up at staff functions, I would literally have people who would touch me and go, oh, we, I, I didn't expect you to look like this. <laughs> And I, I think they thought that because my views were so ghastly, I would, you know, be this sort of long-haired, you know, dreadlocked or two-faced or, you know, something. It, it happened so many times and there's this smugness on the left, which I don't think you see on the right. Yeah, this is Rod Little, one of our colleagues at The Spectator in London. He used to be the, the Today program editor and producer today, one of the prominent BBC television shows and radio shows. He said um, recently in a Spectator column, a BBC apparatchik said to him of a prominent Eurosceptic whose views happen to be shared by half or more of the population, probably more now, Rod, from the, um, the BBC journalist, Rod, you do realise that these people are mad. Just such charge, just such a charge was made by totalitarian movements from the medieval Catholic Church by way of the Jacobins all the way to Stalin's secret police. Um, is this an overstatement? I mean, the BBC and the ABC, for that matter, sure, I think it's fair to say that most of the journalists there subscribe to a progressive left orthodoxy on a variety of issues, most notably climate change and the European Union and Britain. But nevertheless, they still tolerate dissent. I mean, we've been on the program. They've had us on Q&A, among other places. Um, are we, is there a risk here, John Roskin, that we're overstating this argument about uh, fashionable arts groups and media organisations silencing dissent and, and, uh, and discriminating against conservatives and free thinkers. Tom, I'm on uh, pro the ABC Melbourne program with John Fain yeah. on Fridays once a fortnight from 10 o'clock until 10.30 in the morning, once a fortnight. Every second email and tweet to John Fain is, how can you allow a conservative to dominate ABC radio in Melbourne. That's right. <laughs> Half an hour, once a fortnight. Right. But I, I think uh, your identification of left and right is, is correct. There has always been a desire of the left to control in various ways. Mm. And I think what is interesting now is these new forms of control are a result of frustration. No longer is thought and discussion and debate channeled through Sydney Morning Herald, the ABC, magazines. We can, as we all do, log on to, to Mark halfway across the world. We can you know, see Janet on our screens at, at midnight when the Australian goes live, and that is worldwide. Matt Maloney can uh, watch Fox News uh, in the comfort of his, of his lounge room. So there is an in, in great frustration at uh, this increase in diversity, and that's why not only are we seeing a debate about freedom of the press, mm. but also regulation of the press generally. And we have the, the Press Council coming out against uh, the cacophony of voices, 
uh, we have the debate about, well, uh, uh, proportions of the newspaper market are dominated by Rupert Murdoch. And of course, my argument is, well, anyone is free to buy a newspaper or not. And so what we're seeing is the immense frustration. We see, uh, you know, when I go on the ABC, I have people say to me, John, if Fairfax supported the carbon tax and if the ABC supported the carbon tax and if News Limited is 50-50 on the carbon tax, why are 60% of Australians opposed to it? <laughs> and then they usually say, I've never met one of those people. Th that's right. <laughs> well, I, I, I am on uh, with my good friend Sally Warhaft, who used to be the editor of The Monthly, who genuinely did say honestly uh, that until I was on with her, she had never spoken to anyone who voted Liberal. <laughs> but <laughs> this is the frustration we're dealing with. Yeah, that's right. There's a famous quip by Pauline, well, it wasn't a quip, she was being herself, Pauline KLL, a prominent arts writer for The New Yorker um, in the early 70s. And when Richard Nixon won a landslide victory, one of the biggest landslide victories in American presidential history against George McGovern in 1972, I think he carried 61% of the vote. Um, she wrote, I can't believe this is happening. I don't know anyone who voted for Richard Nixon. No. <laughs> Mark? I think, that, I think there's a kind of ideological insecurity uh, on left that is very bizarre. I mean, I quite like, I, I, mean, I was on John Payne's show. With a you were the bunch, other token conservative. With a bunch of, uh, yeah, with a bunch of terrible lefties, but I kind of, in, I kind of enjoy, I don't, uh, I kind of enjoy, I meet a lot of them in Australia. Every time I go on, the, uh, on these ABC panels, I'm sure it'll be the same at Q&A. They'll, they'll be me up against a panel of center left, so soft left, hard left and crazy out of it insane left and that will be a balanced panel for them. and I kind of I kind of enjoy it but they don't on the whole and it's not even and and what's weird is the way it the, the, the idea idea that they're very sensitive in the way of the Soviet Union mm. to uh, uh, a friend of mine on Fox News Juan Williams uh, he's he's a guy who supported Obama he's a Democrat voter uh, he's He's black, so he belongs to an approved minority. And he, and he was asked about airline security, and he said, so, well, you know, I, I get a little nervous if I, if I see, uh, you know, a group of young Muslim men get on the plane and start praying. I, I won't deny that I don't get a little bit nervous. Uh, public radio in the United States fired him for that remark. And they didn't just fire him. The managing editor, or whatever she was, of National Public Radio suggested he was mentally ill. In other words, it's exactly, it's exactly the same argument as the Soviets made. Just, you know, take him off to the sanatorium, uh, to re-education camp, and he'll emerge six months later with a, a glassy-eyed stare and everything will be fine. A, a fellow from the American College of Physicians, mm. he had the valent, he, he, he's the senior, he was the head of the American College of Physicians. And as such, part of his job was to... Uh, write the monthly editorial and whatever it's called, Physicians Monthly, that they send to all their members. And so for the F Valentine's Day issue, and this is crazier than the Saudis in a way, because you kind of expect it from them. Uh, but this, he, he wrote, he thought, well, I'll write a sort of Valentine thing. And he saw that some, there'd been some British Medical Journal survey about the restorative properties of uh, male semen on the uh, female vagina. And so he wrote this little thing on the restorative, wrote this amusing little thing on the restorative properties of semen on the richly vascularized vagina, uh, citing all the technical terms and all the rest of it, not the terms that uh, your average schoolboy would use. And, <laughs> and at the end of it, he said, so this Valentine's Day, who knows, there may be a more appropriate gift than a box of chocolates and a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Female members complained. The American College of Physicians withdrew the entire magazine and pulped every copy. It doesn't exist. He resigned. He, he apologized. He resigned. Uh, they said they weren't going to accept his apology. What he had done was beyond the pay. This is one of the most eminent physicians. In the, he's not a right-wing nut like most of us. He's just a... <laughs> He's just a guy who made an ideologically unsound joke, and he's dead, he's gone, he's over. It's like he never existed. He's been chiseled off the nameplate at the American College of... He's gone. That's far weirder than what the House of South did on Valentine's Day. Before we go to uh, Q&A, I thought 
I just ask about the Andrew Bolt case because this has obviously jolted a lot of people into thinking more about this issue. And I did, uh, before this evening, invite uh, several people who are very critical of the, uh, the, re the reaction to Andrew Bolt and very critical of uh, Bolt himself, uh, David Maher, for example. Um, but I, um, I thought I'd just read out a quote from David Salter, who is the former executive producer of the ABC's Media Watch. And I want to put this to the panel. This is what Salter wrote in the aftermath of the judgment. The case was not about freedom of expression, as the judge took great pains to explain it. It was about the damage that false and malicious journalism can do to individuals for whom recourse to the law is their only practical remedy. The federal court confirmed that Bolt's articles contained errors of fact, distortions of the truth, and inflammatory and provocative language. That, quite rightly, strips away the basis for any fair comment defence Bolt and his publishers might have offered. Salter goes on to say, the lesson here is that Bolt could have made exactly the same points and expressed the same opinions and been protected by the law had he done so in reasonable language relying on established fact. It is to my mind entirely proper that he and his publishers should be brought to account for their bad journalism and careless editing. John, Janet? Well, there's a, a couple of things with that. I don't think you should make bad journalism illegal. <laughs> Some people would say that. But, of course, a and, and if you read the judgment, of course a judge who argues against freedom of speech would say this has nothing to do with freedom of speech. But, if you read the judgment, the judge commented on the fact that he did not like Andrew's tone. He did not like the irony. He did not like the sarcasm. And we, we, we laugh about Canada. This same thing happened in Melbourne a few months ago. And so for me, what's worrying about the case is many aspects, but that Andrew Bolt or any of us is told by a judge how we are to express an opinion. And for me, that's, that's incredibly alarming. Janet Albrechtson. Um, Tom, I hope you never go into politics because you're way too fair to the other side. Um, you know, David Salter's remarks, I think, are rubbish. The, it's everything to do with free speech. You only need to look at Section 16 um, uh, of the Racial Discrimin Act, Discrimination Act to see that. I, I call this group of people uh, like David Salter, like Dave, uh, David Maher and so on, those who say that they are advocates of free speech um, I call them free speech light lefties because if you read the columns that they wrote about Andrew Bolt, uh, let's say they're 1,200 words, uh, they'll spend 1,100 words telling us how evil Andrew Bolt is and then they'll say, but by the way, I'm a big defender of free speech. These are the people who uh, talk about free speech in the abstract. I've done a debate, um, I think a few years ago with David Maher and the organisers rang me up and said, oh, we'd like you to take part in a debate on free speech. Um, David Ma will be advocating in favour of free speech and um, the woman said to me, I've read everything you've written and uh, obviously you would like to go on the other side of him and argue <laughs> against free speech. I said, well, you've obviously read nothing I've ever written no. because I've only ever defended free speech. But David Ma and I were on the same side and he was wonderfully entertaining. He had the audience in the palm of his hand, as he can do, uh, when he talks about free speech in the, in the abstract. But these guys do not defend people like Andrew Bolt when it comes to it. They don't, as, you know, as I've said earlier, they don't get down into the trenches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, Mark is quite right. There is an incredible ideological uh, insecurity here. Mm -hmm. And that's why they don't like our tone. They don't like people who write confidently. Um, I see it again and again. Mark would see it all the time. Um, they think that confidence is... I mean, we see it in the way that they've termed all these battles we had. We've had the history wars. We had the culture wars, we Climate had the change. mummy wars, we had the reading wars, for Christ's sake. You mm. know, like, why is it a war? It's a debate. Yeah. But these are the guys who mm. have dominated the terrain for so long mm. that when they, when they confronted opposition, it was all too brutal for them. Everything was a war. So they're a bit like Kevin Rudd. If you stand up to them, that, you know, they, they go to water. They're, <laughs> they're the most hopeless bullies in the world. Mark, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, heard all, I've heard the David Maher line. I heard that so often in my, in my travels in, in Canada because it's no secret I, I'm not 
I'm not the uh, ideal poster boy for this particular crusade. And uh, it would have been a lot easier if it had been Margaret Atwood or David Suzuki or, some, or somebody like that. But it was still fascinating how so few, uh, how, how, how so many establishment, uh, not just professors of journalism, but columnists, uh, were willing to defend, uh, in effect, state regulation, uh, micro-regulation of newspaper content, even accepting that everything you just read out was mm -hmm. correct. Um, I mean, uh, John said, uh, I don't, I don't think bad, want uh, bad journalism criminalized. Uh, I've been edited by Tom, so I don't want bad editing criminalized. I mean, that, uh, I, uh, I think, I, 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 Andrew is very interesting. He talks about a joke that was in the column, uh, that was read out in court, and, and the way there would be sort of subversive titters from people who were in court while, while, uh, while the, the high-paid legal counsel were, were taking it all very somberly and seriously. This case shames Australia. You are free-born people. You're not, you're not such tender flowers that you need some third-rate jurist to license what you are allowed to read. You are free men and women of one of the, uh, I mean, Australia thinks of itself as a new country. It isn't. Australia's been pretty much the same since 1901. Do you know how many regimes have come and gone in so-called old Europe since that time? Uh, you were here before the Soviet Union, and you've outlasted the Soviet Union. You're one of the oldest settled free societies on the planet. Who is this upstart, third-rate mediocrity to presume to tell free men and women what they can read? It is truly outrageous. <laughs> okay,